We move on and uh, here at home, the government's recent Asian century white paper making clear that Aussie businesses into the future need our neighbours to become good friends, not just Australia, but the United States as well. Well, the dynamics of 21st century trade and investment in the Asia Pacific Conference is in Sydney today. It brings together experts in their field. One such expert is Joshua Meltzer. He's a fellow at the Brookings Institute. Uh, he's been talking about the development of green technology and the impacts on international trade. He's uh, also a guest of the U.S. Study Center, joins us now from our Sydney CBD studio. Warm welcome to you. Let's just understand, I suppose, for want of a better word, the fiscal situation that the United States finds itself in in order to go down the road of another tax. It seems beguilingly seductive to clear the decks of debt, but is there the appetite uh, when there's so much else in the in-tray? Uh, thanks, Carson. Good to be here. I think that the um, absence of any carbon pricing in the United States has created a lot of uncertainty for business, which has hindered investment and made strategic planning over the medium term difficult. So we're actually beginning to see constituents, business constituents and other key actors um, realising that um, a carbon price introduced at a particular rate that graduates um, at a known um, increase over time can provide important certainty for businesses which can actually help them plan. So we have an important business support I think in the United States for a carbon tax. As you point out, there's going to be a demand for um, revenue essentially for the US government to close its budget deficit um, over the uh, coming years and a carbon tax is one way where there's a possibility of taxing a so-called bad CO2 emissions um, and possibly offsetting that with uh, tax reductions possibly on capital or, or on income and this could have the positive effect of actually improving the efficiency of the United States economy and actually stimulating economic growth. What's been efficient about the money spent to date in this space? You've flagged in a recent report that uh, following the financial crisis in 08 and then the passage of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, uh, government spending on developing green energy has more than doubled uh, to roughly $37 billion in 2010. What's been the return on that investment? Uh, that um, spending has been across a broad range of green energy technologies, um, including in the renewable energy space, for instance, on wind, solar, but also in some very cutting edge areas such as developing new capacities around batteries and electronic vehicles and the like. Some of the returns are going to obviously um, come over time because a lot of this is intensive R&D, which is going to require a significant amount of time to actually produce dividends. Mm -hmm. Though you do already see, for instance, um, that in this renewable energy space and in the wind and solar areas in particular, um, very dramatic increases in uptake in solar energy and wind energy in the United States already. It's interesting, nuclear makes it onto the list there and not here. How is Australia's debate being fashioned if we're not even learning from best and breed, i.e. the US? Well, the nuclear debate has always been a contentious one here. I think certainly the broader nuclear energy picture is being given um, somewhat of a setback by the results of Fukushima Daiichi and the meltdown that happened in Japan. And so reconsiderations of the safety issues around nuclear power plants is always a primary concern. Uh, but in order to make the type of deep cuts in CO2 emissions going forward, which are required, is going to certainly require a particular role for nuclear energy going forward. What about the regulations that have already kicked in? Uh, you flagged as well 2010 new passenger cars and light vehicle trucks, not to mention medium duty passenger cars. They've all got to be compliant. It seems that there's moves afoot, although is it piecemeal rather than wholesale? That's right, Carson. The federal government has essentially, in the absence of legislation coming out of Congress, used what authority it currently has under various legislation, the Clean Air Act, 
been the primary one to push for um, CO2 reductions in particular sectors, the transportation sector being a key one, coming off a very low base in the United States where fuel efficiency has been below OECD average for a long time. But the targets now that are set out to 2020 and 2025 are certainly going to drive a, um, some significant innovation in the automobile sector in order to actually reach these standards and that's also going to have a very significant impact as far as emissions from that sector going forward. Tell me about some of the trade implications as well uh, when it comes to pricing carbon. W with what we have seen particularly out of Europe, what's been the, I suppose, the darkest hour there and, and have things ever recovered on, on a credibility front? There's, but there was a lot of mispricing, it would seem. The, yeah, there's going to be a range of implications for pricing carbon. Some of them, um, from a trade perspective, potentially are going to be very positive. For instance, it's going to send a very important price signal globally that there's going to be increased demand in the United States for the type of technologies that can be used to reduce CO2 emissions. So this should stimulate significant amounts of further innovation and development of these type of technologies, not only in the United States, but also globally. In the EU, there's uh, been challenges around its cap and trade system, and certainly the collapse of the carbon price over recent years has meant that the price signal is not out there in the market, and there have been further issues recently around the mm. decision to include aviation in its CO2 um, emission scheme. And yet, as you acknowledge, the benefits of any carbon tax only really shoot home with a truly liberalised world trade system. One, put simply, that doesn't exist? There is certainly at the moment um, a significant underpinning of globalised mm. and liberalised world trade through the rules of the World Trade Organisation. Uh, to those who follow that process, the current round of negotiations, the so-called Doha round, certainly are not going anywhere at the moment. But the rules still exist and they certainly um, are the basis for liberalised trade at the moment. But absolutely more can be done in this space. APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, recently made some important progress in that space at the leaders' meeting in Vladivostok it's recently. Interesting you call it important progress, uh, you've also called it a narrow list of goods, uh, 25 to be precise, 54 rather, 54, yeah. uh, but you're still finding fault with that, as if to say they cherry picked a list that suited them and then surprise surprise being politicians, they kicked that can down the road again, it's not going to be implemented till 2015. Well, the, the next process now for APEC is that they actually have to identify how they're going to reduce tariffs to this average 5% commitment. The progress really is in the fact that they've identified a list. This has been a very contentious issue in the WTO negotiations where they've also been seeking to identify a list. So in that sense, there is some progress. But as you do correctly point out, the list is limited and more certainly can be done to broaden it out. What, uh, quite simply, does Asia represent as a block? in all of this, in every sense of the word I'm wondering, as far as moving together to either thwart or encourage uh, a global take up of this one, because some of the worst emitters come from our neighbours to the north. That's true. There are some very significant emitters, China clearly now being the world's largest CO2 emitter, so making sure that China is part of the climate change solution is absolutely key here. Um, but China is also well placed to play a constructive role in this space. It's going to probably be a very important demonstration and testing ground for a lot of the new technologies where these can be scaled up at a significant speed in ways that is not possible in the rest of the world. And China is in its own way moving in this direction, realising for its own particular domestic reasons, not only climate change, but also in terms of energy security and just sheer environmental quality in China that it needs to do more on this front. Well, uh, Joshua, you've uh, animated and uh, shed some valuable insights. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thanks you. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it, Carson. Joshua Meltzer there, fellow at the Brookings Institute, been in Sydney as uh, a guest at the US Study Centre at the University of Sydney.